Happy Sunday. Psalm 136.1 one says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that You are so good. You are so merciful. We acknowledge that we need to give You thanks for all that You've done for us. Especially giving the Lord Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins. Help us, O Lord. We can never stop giving You thanks. Thank You, thank You, thank You for the present freedom we have to worship in spirit and in truth. We thank You, Lord God, for the birthday celebrant this week. We thank You, Lord, for another year for Manang Cesar. Thank You, Lord, for his life and his support for the church. Thank you for letting my ancestor be a blessing to us. Continue to give him physical and spiritual strength, O Lord God. Use his life mightily as much as possible for your glory and honor. And I thank you so much, Lord God, for his willingness also to join us in Bible study. Thank you, O Lord. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to continue our series in the Minor Prophets. So let's review, starting with Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. All right. Let me read, read a quote from Ecclesiastes 1.9 to start this sermon. That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Now, what I'm going to share with you today from our passage, which happened 8th century BC, is happening today in 2022 AD. And it's happening right before our eyes, especially if you're living in California. Now, I don't know if you notice, more and more crimes are happening. And when do crimes usually happen? Usually crimes happen at night. But now more and more crimes are happening in broad daylight. Look at these images that came from, uh, that were done in North Long Beach. Now this image here, what crimes are these called? Smash and grab. Now why are they happening more and more? Let's look for answers found in the Old Testament minor prophet in the book of Hosea. More specifically, Hosea chapter 7 verse 1 to 7. Hosea chapter 7 verse 1 to to seven. I'm going to read from the New King James Version. Verse 1. When I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was uncovered. The wickedness of Samaria, for they have committed fraud. A thief comes in. A band of robbers takes spoil outside. Now let's look at that phrase, when I would have healed Israel. Now what does that imply? 
you know, God would have healed Israel. God would have restored that relationship with them despite, despite all the idolatry, prostitution, and wickedness, and uh, all the and their unfaithfulness, and even their lewd acts when they started worshiping idols. God would have healed them. That's how gracious and merciful God is. But it says that their, their iniquity of Ephraim, of Ephraim was uncovered. What does that imply? Does that imply that God all of a sudden, as He looks at Ephraim, also known as Israel, that God finds something rotten? He has uncovered them? For example, I went to the store. Miriam and I went to the store. We saw some strawberries. And as we, you know, we always look, make sure there's nothing rotten, nothing spoiled. Take it home, right? And usually, when we open it, oh no. We uncover something. There is now mold in the strawberries. Was it like that when God uncovered it? No. Here's what it means when God, when, uh, when the iniquity of Ephraim was uncovered. According to J. Vernon McGee, it says this regarding this passage here, this verse. What was happening in Israel during Hosea's day was that the sin which had been covered was being uncovered. That which had been doing secretly, they were now doing openly. The culture, that society is changing and was changing and now what was considered sinful and shameful is now acceptable and done in the open. He continues, there was no shame, no conviction, no conscience relative to their sin. It is one thing to sin in secret, that's bad enough. But it's even worse to bring your sin out in the open and flaunt it before the world. The sins of Ephraim, aka Israel, from the people's view is no longer sinful. Worse than that is now something to show off to the world. Look at that. They, they act as if like, whoa, I'm, this is something good. I, I did this, I did that, I do this, I do that. Look at me. For example, I slept with this many people. That's how they're flaunting their sin. Samaria. It says here in this verse here, Samaria. Samaria is the capital of Israel. And there was also crimes done there. Notice, notice where the robbers were bringing their spoils. They're stolen goods. They're bringing it outside. Usually when you, when you steal something, you want to cover it up. But no. Abandoned robbers take the spoil outside. I look, look at the other versions here. The New English Version. For they do what is wrong. Thieves break into houses and gangs rob people out in the streets. NIV Version. They practice deceit. Thieves break into houses, bandits rob in the streets. Reminds me of these people who do smash and grab. They break in, they steal, even in broad daylight. Their wickedness is now part of their culture. What was bad is now considered acceptable and good. It seems like that's what's happening in our societies right now. I, I don't know if you noticed too, but I definitely noticed that especially in women's fashion, the cleavage is now going lower and lower, and the hemline is getting higher and higher. Mora morality is rapidly, rapidly declining. And according to J. Vernon McGee, the Lord, again, the Lord would have forgive, would have forgiven, forgiven their iniquity if they would repent and turn to Him. Instead, they persisted in their wickedness and went farther and farther into it. Verse 2. They do not consider in their hearts that I remember, the God, is God is talking here, that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own deeds have surrounded them. They are before my face. Their hearts and their minds were so callous, were so hardened, were so blinded, that they were thinking that they were going to get away with it. That God wasn't watching them. But God sees everything. Nothing is hidden from God's eyes. Hebrews 4.13 says, Nothing in all creation is, his, is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom 
we must give account. God sees everything. And at the end of our life, we will have to give an account to what we have done. Verse 3. They make a king glad with their wickedness and princes with their lies. Now why would a king be glad with the people's weak wickedness? And the prince is glad with the, with the lies of the people. Why? Why? These leaders, this royal family, were all part of the corruption. They were all part of the system. They were getting their kickbacks. They were doing bribes and extortions. You know, we hear stories today of politicians doing the same thing, working in the political system, not for the people, but for their bank accounts. And according to the next verses, this type, uh, this type of mentality and culture was so pervasive from the poor person on the streets all the way to the royal family. Look at verse 4. They are all, they are all adulterers. Like an oven heated by a baker, he ceases stirring the fire by kneading the dough until it is leavened. In the New English, English Version it says, until the kneaded dough is ready for baking. So the, basically the, the, ba the baker would knead the dough uh, until it's leavened, meaning it, it, I believe it, it rises, then it's ready for baking. Now the people, the community has gone so bad. God says in this verse here, they're all adulterers. He describes their inner lusts with a comparison of a baker preparing an oven for baking bread. Oh, by the way, there are many commentaries on how, how people interpret this passage. I'm going to try to show you what I believe is the most, um, the one that most makes most sense to me. Now the baker in essence, in this passage here, is preheating the oven. After kneading the dough and waiting the dough to rise and is, is leavened, meaning it's ready for put into the oven, it says here the baker ceases or stops stirring the fire. Now why would a baker do that? Why would he stop stirring the fire? Because I believe it is the, the oven is at its hottest. There's no more need to stir up the fire. The heat is at its peak. And at that point, it's time to put the bread, uh, or the, yeah, the bread into the oven. That means it's time, it's ready to be put in the oven. This describes the lust of the people. The lust, the passions, the wickedness of the peoples was at its peak. Sins were now in the open. Sins were now acceptable. And sins were now encouraged. Immorality and wickedness have gone have become a part of their life. And whenever God is not the leader of a country, like in Israel, uh, these leaders, these elites, constantly want to grab more and more power and control so they can influence the hearts of the people. They'll push and shove and step on anything or anyone who gets in their way. Look at verse 5 and 7. On that day of our king, the officials became sick with the heat of wine, meaning that they got drunk. Uh, the, on the day of our king, possibly a celebration, poss possibly the, the king's birthday and everyone's having fun, enjoying lots of wine and getting drunk, the officials became sick with the heat of wine. And he, he is the king, he stretched out his hand with scoffers. Now, what does it mean for a king to stretch out his hand? When he's at his throne, he's, he stretches out his hand. That means a signal for the people to come to him, to, that the king is welcoming them. And here, he stretched out his hand with scoffers. Scoffers are people that are making fun of him. That doesn't make sense. Maybe the king was so drunk that he didn't know what he was doing, but he, he stretched out his hand for the, uh, with the scoffers. That means they're, they're able to be welcomed. They'd come to the king. Verse 7 and verse 6. For their hearts, this is talking about the scoffers, their hearts are like an oven 
as they approach their plotting. Their anger smolders all night. They knew all this. They knew, they knew that they were going to plot to overthrow the king. They were angry at the king for some reason. Maybe the king said something wrong. Maybe the king, the king did something bad. Maybe they, they disagreed. But in any case, they were plotting to kill the king, overthrow the king, kingdom. In the morning, it burns like a flaming fire. That's how passionate, that's how angry, that's how lustful, lustful they were to gain this power. Verse 7, All of them are, like, are hot like an oven, and they consume their rulers, and their kings have fallen. None of them calls on me. These leaders, these rulers, their thinking was more and more indulgent of power and control. They were no longer serving the people. They didn't, they didn't want God to be part of the equation. It was all about what benefited them. And without God being part of the equation, there's no moral standard, no moral compass, no moral guide. Reminds me of Joshua 21, 25 says, In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's how the people of Israel were operating. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And when a society operates this way, when they take God out of the picture as their standard and guide, when according to that last phrase, verse 7, when none of them calls on God, there's chaos, there's anarchy, there's lawlessness. Seems like what's happening with America. When the words, in God we trust, which is written in our currencies, and under God in the Pledge of Allegiance, it becomes offensive. When society wants the Ten Commandments out of the judicial courtrooms, when saying in Jesus' name at the end of a prayer in a public setting has become unacceptable. When America will no longer call on God, there will be chaos, there will be anarchy, there will be lawlessness. Brothers and sisters, God wants to heal Israel. God wants to heal you and me. God wants to bring healing to America. But if we continue this pathway, this path as a country, there will be consequences. God says this to King Solomon regarding Israel when they were being unfaithful. 2 Chronicles 7, 13 and 14. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or pestilence, or send pestilence among my people. In essence, God is going to, because of their unfaithfulness, God's going to do all these, uh, refrain the blessing and release judgment upon Israel. But, look at verse 14. But, if my people who are called by my name and will humble themselves, and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then, I'll, they'll, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. This is what we need to do. We need to do as a people, as a church, as a country. We need to humble ourselves and pray and seek His face and turn from our wicked ways. You know, and it really starts with us and praying. Because as much as we want to control the hearts and minds of people and lead them to the Lord, you know, it's going to take God's intervention to make this happen, to heal this land, to restore our close relationship with God. It's so critical right now to pray. To pray as believers, as followers of Jesus, to be that light, but also to be faithful in praying for our country, our government leaders, our brother and sister, our fellow man. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, you know exactly what's happening in America. You know what's happening around the world, O oh Lord God. It seems as if no one calls upon you, Lord God. 
that they are doing their own thing. They're, they're doing what's right in their own eyes. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you make a revival in America. That people may look to you, call upon you, turn from their wicked ways, Lord God, and humble ourselves before you, Lord. We lift it to President Biden and Vice President Harris, Heavenly Father, that you give them wisdom, you give them humility, Lord God, to serve the people faithfully. Continue to help them, Lord God, to do what is right and honoring to you, O Lord. And Lord, help us, Lord God, to continue to pray and not, and not cease to pray, Lord God, uh, again, for our, our government leaders, our communities, our church, O Lord God, because we definitely need you to to be to come into our our lives and work in our lives, O Lord God, with your Holy Spirit. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name, Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In Jesus' name, Amen. Oh.